everybody. Muscle Intelligence Podcast. I'm your host, Pempikulski, with the lovely, the talented, the wonderful, the brilliant, the amazing chef, Ashley Van Houten. Ash, tell me about your ongoing project. Are we allowed to tell everyone what it is? <sighs> yes, we can do that. Thank you for giving me a authentic lead in so I don't have to just mention it. I don't have to just like cough and be like, <coughs> I'm writing a cookbook. You have to gloat. Yeah. So actually, you're currently in the process of developing, I don't want to say writing, but developing yeah. an amazing book, an amazing resource on ultimately recipes for organ meats. Yeah. Is that an understatement or is that pretty accurate? No, that is 100% accurate. And it's something that I've been kind of mulling over like the last year. And honestly, working with you, I think is one of the things that kind of gave me the confidence to like push from just something I was thinking about in my head to actually doing it because this is an idea. It's a topic. Obviously, anybody who's listened to this podcast and heard me telling you to please eat liver, like it's obviously something that I'm passionate about, but it was so sort of niche and weird that I thought no one's going to care about this topic or want to buy this book. But then I thought people thought that about keto and carnivore and paleo and all of these things. And now you can find a hundred of those cookbooks in Barnes and Noble. And I feel really strongly about this topic. So I've signed a contract. It's happening. I'm hoping to get done like this spring for maybe like a fall release of this book, but it's the real deal. I'm currently deep in recipe development and I'm learning a lot as I go because I'm actually not a chef. I have like zero background in this stuff at all, except for the fact that I just really love to eat. So I've learned a lot. It's been really empowering, like coming up with recipes and working with ingredients that I'm not familiar with. And every time something comes out delicious and other people want to eat it too, I feel really good about it. So it's happening. It's a lot. And I'm really excited. As you know, I think very well, people don't write books because they want to be rich and famous because that doesn't happen for 99.9% of people. But you do it because you really, really want to do it. And I really wanted to do this. Like I told the publishers, I'm like, if this doesn't work out, like I'm writing this book one way or the other. If I have to like print it out and like staple it together and just like throw it at people, like I'm going to do it. So (laughs) I think they responded to my passion and they were good to go. So um, yeah, so it's happening. Good for you. That's amazing. And honestly, I would love some recipes. So I've got literally a freezer full of every organ meat, I think under the sun. Yeah. So Anya from Belcampo sent me a bunch of stuff to try. And I told you like, I love their stuff, but she sent me uh, chicken liver, lamb liver, I think hearts as well. I mean, a bunch of stuff. And I honestly just don't cook it because I don't have a great recipe. Like when I do something, I want to do it well. Like I want the experience to be exceptional, right? Like I don't want it to be like, hey, I'm just throwing this down because I'm trying to get a bunch of organ meat in. Like I want to have a great experience. So I create the cognitive association of like, hey, this is good for me and it tastes awesome. Let's do that more often. And same for my kids. So that's ultimately what hopefully you're able to do is this idea of creating a good experience because I guarantee you, most people have had liver. First time you had it, it was like your parents shoving it down your throat when you're five years old saying, hey, this is liver and onions and this is good for you. Go eat this. Whereas, you know, that's a bad experience. And then we all have this create this negative association where like, hey, these organ meats are bad. But here's an interesting observation. My kids love organ meat and it's not something that I've ever like shoved on them. And, you know, I just kind of let them have a great experience and they love it. And I think if there's an organic draw to this stuff. I think naturally the human palate or the human body is drawn to it because of the natural massive amount of value and nutrients that exist there. So I think because we have a bad experience, just like anything, you know, the first time I had Vegemite, like I wanted to throw up, so I'll never eat it again because I have an association. Whereas I'm sure there's someone out there who could create an awesome Vegemite recipe, which would taste fantastic, but you couldn't pay me a million dollars to eat it because of my first experience. So if you can create some entry level, um, recipes for people to go, hey, like, try this. This is going to rock your world. You're going to love this. It takes no time at all. This is this is where you go. I think you could really shift a lot of people and bring them over to the dark side. Yeah, that's absolutely the plan. And I mean, I think what you touched on with your kids there is important too, because the whole not eating organ meats thing is totally a rich, modern, Western approach. Like other cultures throughout history, like everyone's eaten the whole animal because that's just what you did. And you recognized inherently that those pieces, the organ meats and the offal was the stuff that was actually the most healthy. And our friend Gabrielle, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, the muscle-centric medicine doctor, she teases me all the time about the food that I'm eating, but she feeds her baby liver and Aries loves it. Aries is what, six months old and she crushes liver because she recognizes, you know, that Mm -hmm. it's healthy, right? So I think I'll definitely email you some recipes. And did you see just this weekend, I was in Montreal and I went to Canada's second best restaurant as of 2019, Joe Beef. Have you ever been there? Nope. Oh Joe my Beef? Goodness. Joe Beef, you gotta What's go. What's the first best restaurant? 
actually, I don't even remember which one it was. I just remember like this one is very hard to get into. And I was like researching why is this place such a big deal? I mean, it's always been like an institution in Montreal. Like if you like food and you go to Montreal, you try to get into Joe Beef. It's very French, right? Obviously. And they had tons and tons of organ meats on their menu. And we literally ordered every single one, like tripe, terrine, sweetbreads, everything we could get. And it was incredible. And it was so good for me too, because I'm in the midst of writing this book and I'm having my moments where I'm like, shit, is anybody going to eat any of these recipes? Are they even going to be willing to try it as delicious as they are? And I went to this restaurant that's like hugely, hugely respected and people come from all over the world to eat at this place and they highlight organ meats in their food. So it's just a Mm -hmm. reminder that like this stuff is valuable, it's important and it's healthy. And we just need to start opening our minds a little bit to trying some new things. Are you going to market to mostly like old European people that are fat and overweight? (laughs) No, because I don't need to market to them. They're all over it anyway. (laughs) Who I'm trying to market to are health-minded people and also meat eaters. Like I'm not trying to change anybody's mind. If you're like a vegan, like you probably should not be following me on any level. I'll counter that saying (laughs) if you are vegan, you probably should be following actually and figuring it out. You know how I feel though. I'm like so disillusioned. I feel like people are just so entrenched in their own beliefs that like- I'm so glad that people are coming around on that though. Like every (laughs) doctor I talk to seems to be finally realizing like vegan for moral reasons is awesome. Vegan for health reasons is literally stupidity, I think. I don't even think it makes sense for moral reasons because do you know how many animals are getting killed for your soy crops? Like animals are dying all the time. Like if you don't like the idea of eating an animal, okay, but you're not morally superior for doing it. Like animals are dying for you, whether you like it or not. Yeah. And you know what? Actually, one thing that kind of rubs me the wrong way is parents who make their kids vegan. And I think- It's honestly negligent. I think it's just you get your own choice. But, you know, it's funny. My son has a best friend who's a vegan. You know, it's to the extent that he's got psychological damage. Like he says, I won't sit beside you when you're eating meat because I find it's disgusting. Like that's just wrong on so many levels. You've just destroyed this kid's psyche for not just now, but forever. And that's ultimately a big, big challenge. But, anyways, I don't want to talk about people's moral decisions. That's not my place to make judgment. But there certainly is. Certainly irrefutable evidence around the benefits of eating animal products and at what level, uh, you know, that's your decision to make for your own genetics. And I think that is where the reality lies. You know, I have my genetics read this week again by a different person and she was amazing and super brilliant and said, you know, hey, here's all the dietary choices you should be making and here's the ones you are making and there's pretty good alignment here. And it was awesome to hear that. But that's the reality is there's people out there who can, if you have the financial means, you know, hire somebody to tell you, hey, based on your genes, here's what you should be eating. Here's what you need more of. Here's what you need less of. Here's what your body can do really well. Because there is genes that do really well with high amounts of saturated fat and ones that do bad with really high amounts of saturated fat. And same with carbohydrates and same thing with every other nutrient under the sun. So I think taking an objective stance here makes a lot of sense. And as I said in the podcast in the past, there's probably 10% or less of the population that can functionally live off of a vegan diet, meaning you have the ability to convert ALA into DHA and, you know, the vegetable form of omega-3 into, you know, the usable form, but everyone else can't do that. And so if you're a vegan who can't convert ALA into DHA, that's a huge issue. And, you know, there's probably other B vitamins you're deficient in and amino acids you're deficient in, but as well as the innumerable detriments and problems with tofu and soy and, and all these excess grains on your digestive tract, that stuff aside... You know, I think there is a small set subset of the population that can probably get away, not thrive, but get away on a vegan diet. Again, this is going to be yeah. controversial. We're going to piss people off, but well, neither here nor there. And I think too, like the concept of intuitive eating is something that sounds really good, but you really can only uh, it's get just there. Dumb. Well, wait, hear me out though. I think that there is some benefit to that concept, but only when you have all of these other lifestyle factors that you're always talking about sorted out, right? Because when people say like, you need to honor your cravings and you need to eat intuitively, it's like, well, if I'm metabolically deranged or if I have (laughs) dysfunctional attitudes towards food, like my body is telling me to fucking eat cookies all day. Like I shouldn't probably listen to that, should I? However, I will say that when I do have all of these other lifestyle factors sorted out that you're always talking about, right? Like you're moving. I'm like, I have a stress management program in place. I'm sleeping well. I'm doing all of these things properly. I usually can actually pay attention to what my body's telling me a little bit better. And I'm the person who's like, when other people are cutting the fat off their steaks or taking the skin off their salmon, like I'm eating it off of their plates. And like, that's the stuff that I've always gravitated towards. And I know that that works for me. But when I'm not feeling 
tip top, like I'm reaching for the cake. So just telling people to eat intuitively, I think there's got to be more to it. Yeah. And there's so many levels to that, Ash. Like the reality is that our palates are manipulated with obviously chemically engineered foods that are designed to make our brains just light up when we put them in our mouth. The best example is children, right? So you feed a kid a Dorito, that's a chemically engineered food or a Gatorade or a Snickers bar. And you go, hey, son or daughter, now I want you to eat some steak. Or now I want you to eat some olive oil. Or now I want you to eat some liver. And the likelihood of them saying anything but ew is basically zero, right? Because their palate's so manipulated with these hyper palatable foods. And you go, hey, but no, no, no. Now we're going to go eat these really nutritious foods. And they, their brain goes, well, no, I can eat all these amazing hyper palatable foods over here. It gives me a massive amount of calories, satisfies all my urges in a really small amount of time with no physical effort. I don't have to chew these things. Why would I ever choose the good foods? It's manipulation at the highest level. So actually telling somebody to like, hey, eat intuitively, I think is just stupid because of the levels of manipulation within our food supply, it's even as far as the unconscious stuff, right? That the chemical engineered foods, the hyperpalatable foods, the colors that are used and manipulated, the emotional manipulation around food. If you lived in a jungle a thousand years ago where you're getting your food off a farm, absolutely eat intuitively, 1000%. But when you're walking through a grocery store and you're hungry and somebody says, hey, you should eat intuitively, good luck. Bullshit. So one thing I want to bring up with respect to organ meats before we move on is I came across a company and you're going to be super excited about this. It's called Hunter Gatherer. Are you familiar with this company? Are they a UK-based company? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Man, I re- actually, they're following me and I reached out to them. I was like, man, I've come across their stuff and it's... Icelandic lamb. And I was like, oh my gosh, liver and heart from Icelandic lamb. Sign me up. That's amazing. Um, it's, it's amazing. I was like, God, send me cases. But they don't ship to the US or Canada. I was like, oh man, you guys stink. So get your friends from Iceland to send you more like goat heads in the mail or no, something. No, so, but I'm going to the UK to teach a camp April 2nd. Right, right. So I'll be there. I'm going to get a case. I'm going to try to get it back to the US, but I'm going to guess the likelihood of that is very small. Yeah, hey, I'm not going to smuggle <laughs> Icelandic liver <laughs> across international borders. But Canada may not be an issue because Canada usually is okay with stuff like that. We still don't have as many good companies though, honestly, because in the course of this project that I've been working on, I've been really like doing a lot of work to source some of these ingredients. Like I have a butcher shop local to me that's really good that I've been getting a lot of stuff like liver and hearts and even brain and stuff like that. But looking for like kidney and tripe and like different animal organs, like not just beef. And it's been kind of tough and we don't have the same level of companies like the Belcampos and the Butcher Box and the US. In Canada? Yeah. It's oh, so I'm going to give my butcher. My butcher's amazing. He'll give you everything you need. Not my, sorry, not my, he's actually a farmer, but he'll give you everything you need. It definitely takes a little bit more research, but I mean, it's available. And like you said, yeah, we're a little bit more open. Like we'll eat some animals in Canada that the U.S. frowns on and like we can have foie gras all over the place. And I know they've been banning that in some places in the States. Like stuff's happening. My guy in Canada, for anybody who needs this, Green yeah. Pasture Farm. Again, no affiliation. He's become a friend only because he supplies me with amazing quality meat. Green Pasture Farm underscore Ontario is the Instagram handle. Greenpasturesfarm.ca is the website. So he does amazing, amazing quality beef, bison, pig, and chicken. And I think that's all. He has access to like, yeah, he's like super, super high quality. Yeah. And every time I'm in Canada, that's where I get all of my meat from. And again, I pay. It's not like I have an affiliation. It's just, he's just got good quality stuff. And if you ask him, because he's literally the farmer, he will also give you the organs and stuff. He actually, on my request, does what he calls, I think, a paleo ground. So it's Mm -hmm. 50-50 organ and muscle meat. And my kids love it. He's got these amazing like pepperette things that are fantastic. Great, great snack. And Ash, you'll be all over that. Awesome. I'm going to check them out as soon as we're done talking because that's very exciting. Yeah, do exciting. it. His name's Mike. He's fantastic. Cool. Anyways. Question. How afraid are you of the coronavirus? I only <laughs> took off my mask so that we could talk. Okay. And right now it's currently around my eyes yeah. so I can't see anybody else and don't get germs into my eyes. That's what I thought. No. Someone asked me this this morning. Actually, I was on a call with my web developer and he said, you know, hey man, I don't want to go to any live events because... I don't want to get coronavirus. And I was like, man, do you realize the likelihood of you, one, getting it maybe, sure, but you getting anything more than symptoms of a common flu is basically zero, provided you're not an ill, rundown, disease-prone human being. It seems as though it's going after people who are smokers and over 80. And if you're both of those things, which likely I do not listen to this podcast, if you're a smoker and over 80, 
then you may be at risk, in which case stay home and you know wear a mask. But everyone else, likelihood of anything wrong or anything happening beyond maybe an illness, like you're going to get this. This is something I didn't know. You're going to get this. You almost want to get it. This is the type of thing that apparently is going to be in our ecosystem forever. Mm-hmm. It's like the flu. It's not going away. It's going to be here forever. But you know, it's just a matter of how sick are you going to get and are you susceptible to it? Like if you get the flu every year and, and you have a rundown immune system, you might get it. And great, accept it, boost your immune system. I've got a great immune protocol that I give myself, my kids, and all my friends that I'll share with everybody. The likelihood of anything bad happening is small. That being said, I wasn't all that excited to go spend eight hours in an enclosed space at the Arnold Classic with 100,000 sneezing, coughing meat bags. Yeah. Not all that excited about it. Yeah. So again, pick and choose your battles, but I will share the immune protocol, which is obviously not my creation. It's just kind of what I've curated throughout the years, if you're interested. Yeah, please tell us. So vitamin A, super important. I usually get from cod liver oil and I'll usually do, I don't know the dose of vitamin A. I usually do like just more frequent dosing. The thing with vitamin A is you don't need it for a long time. You just need kind of a a bullet's dose over a couple of days, like two to three days, short term. Again, I don't want to say the dose because I don't want to mess it up. Increase your vitamin D daily. So you do vitamin D always in the morning because apparently it can be very stimulating. So Vitamin D for children, I'm doing two to 3,000 I use. For adults, I'm doing five to 10,000 I use every single day for probably 10 days. To be honest, I usually do it almost every day anyways at that dose. Um, I'll also add in some vitamin C. So like 500 to 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C. I will add in some reishi mushroom. And if it's just like a daily maintenance dose, I'll do three to five grams at least once a day. If it's like, hey, I feel myself getting sick, I'll throw that up to like 10 grams twice a day. And there's one more thing, which is an imperative part of this, N-acetylcysteine, NAC, Mm N-A-C, 500 milligrams twice a day has been shown clinically to be more effective than the flu shot. So that stack right there, like, and again, it's pennies, right? It's not like it's this huge expensive stack. It's pennies because all these things are very cheap supplements effectively will knock anything out that comes through your system. Like again, if you have a compromised immune system, take necessary precautions. But if you're an average human or an above average human and you train, you're healthy, you get sunlight, you get sleep and your body isn't dysfunctional, this will be more than enough. Okay. That's really helpful. Why do you think people are just like losing their shit over this when we all know that more people are dying from the average flu, not to mention cardiovascular lifestyle related illnesses every day, month, year. Why do you think we're all just losing it over this one? Who knows? It's fear based media, right? That's our world. And we talked about that with Dr. Perlmutter. We talk about that all the time. Who knows? Um, and, and what we're really concerned with at the highest level is the mass hysteria, the mass consumption, the mass purchasing of whatever masks and hand sanitizer and toilet paper and whatever the hell else are being sold out of. That's the big concern here, right? And maybe the reason all these events are being canceled, Ash, is because the worst thing that could happen is thousands of people trying to get into hospitals at once. That's the problem, right? And I think it makes a lot of sense to cancel these large events, to be honest, is just for that. Let's say you get 10,000 people that all get this at the same time. What's going to happen to the hospitals, right? If all these people have to go to the hospital at once, we're fucked. So it does make sense. As much as I think it's a little bit absurd, I think it also does make sense because it's highly likely that if you're in an enclosed space with 100,000 people who are you know, farting and coughing and sneezing and picking their nose. Ugh. <laughs> I really don't want to go to any events now. Now You just described that's what an expo is. I'm like, I'll pass. I'll well, stay like, home. <laughs> yeah. I mean, ultimately, right? People are yeah. rude and, and gross. And yeah. so it's probably a realistic thing. So is hand sanitizer enough? Absolutely not. The best thing you can do, take your immune protocol, take it often, and wash your hands a lot. And again, apparently this is not an airborne virus. This is transmitted by contact. Mm -hmm. So I think it's important that we acknowledge that just wash your hands, man. Don't pick your nose. Don't bite your fingernails. Don't don't eat with your hands. All these things are important to acknowledge. That being said, there's one thing I wanted to talk about today. I had a really interesting conversation with somebody last week, and he's been asking me for over a year now, will you prep me for a bodybuilding contest? And my answer is inevitably, no, I won't. And I got to thinking, he asked me a question. He said, what's it going to take for you to be interested in preparing me for a contest? That's a really interesting question that sent me down this path of pondering, uh, what's it going to take for me to actually be interested in? Why am I not interested in preparing someone for a bodybuilding contest? Well, here's the answer. I am actually interested in preparing people for bodybuilding contests. And I do. And I do have a number of clients who are extremely successful. But here's the thing. Here's what I don't want to perpetuate in bodybuilding. I don't want to perpetuate the 
mindless, egocentric pursuit of muscle. I don't want to perpetuate steroids. And again, I'm not a hypocrite. I acknowledge I did steroids. I'm not against it. What I don't want to perpetuate is this steroid-based culture that exists, meaning people think that I got to the Olympia stage because I took some bigger protocol than everybody else. And if that's what you think, you're an idiot. I want to perpetuate health-based, training-centric bodybuilding. Meaning when you go on stage, you look healthy, your waist is small, you feel vibrant, you feel amazing. Maybe you're a little bit tired, maybe you're a little bit shitty because you're so lean and you're so calorie depleted, even though you don't need to be calorie depleted if you're doing this correctly. That's the type of stuff I want to perpetuate. So I want to perpetuate healthy, vital, hard, intense, disciplined lifestyle and regime, not hey, let's get in shape for one time, a one-time event that I can never maintain again. And, and it almost kills me to get there. Exactly. How many substances can I throw down the gullet in the kitchen sink that yeah. I can get me there? You know, mm -hmm. I fucking despise that. And I'll be honest, at one time in my life, I was there too. But I can't, in good moral faith, perpetuate that fucking nonsense anymore because I know my ignorant self didn't have anyone leading myself at the time. And I wish I had. So I'd like to be what we'll call in this instance, the lighthouse in the storm. And I think there's other people out there doing this stuff too. Thank you if you are. But you know, how do we optimize health first? I think a body, when it's in its healthiest form, is naturally very lean. It's naturally very happy. It's naturally very stress-free. How do we perpetuate that and then that leads down the path of, okay, now I feel really great. So I want to train. So I'm recovering more. So I can push harder. Now I want to subject myself to the discipline. I want to subject myself to harder work on a more consistent basis, really build out my ability to do work and recover from work. And that leads me down the path of bodybuilding. So if that's a 12-month process, then so be it. But what I don't want to do is take on clients right now who are just like, hey, man, I want to get in shape at all costs. I'm going to take way more gear than I should or than anyone should and just get on stage because I'm so insecure in myself that I think this is going to fill some void in my life. And there's probably 95% of people out there doing it are doing that. Yep. That sucks. So point being, my client roster right now is zero people like that. Everyone is health-centric. I don't take on a lot of clients. I'm super selective, obviously. Again, a lot of people aren't competing. But everyone's objective is, I want to be healthy. I want my body to function really, really well. What should I do for that? You know, what supplements should I take? What workouts should I do? What should I do for sleep? What should I do for breathing? Should I be doing meditation, my daily walks? You know, my concept of breathe, walk, meditate being the foundation of all human optimization. That's what it's going to take for me to take someone who wants to be a bodybuilder and lead them to the top. Because... That's where I want the sport to go. My belief is I can take, again, not anybody, but someone who has the all-in mentality and take that all-in mentality and deliver it toward health first and then performance later. Again, health and performance shouldn't be separate thoughts, right? They should be one. But I think most people think of those things as being separate. Well, again, maybe not, right? Maybe at the highest level, bodybuilding is not healthy because you're pushing so much food, because you're pushing so much training and so much ultimate physiological stress. But at the end of the day, you should be doing everything in your power to maintain optimal body function while you're pursuing this high-level muscle building. And then to finish this off, my belief is, that most people who optimize their health, who optimize their mental state will no longer pursue muscle building because they won't need it. But again, I'll leave that as the asterisk that not everyone needs to pay attention to. Like, I think it's still a really worthwhile endeavor. Like, I love the idea of this daily battleground for improving my mind, improving my body, improving my confidence and my self-discipline. Like, there's nothing else in life like it. But doing it for the wrong reasons is wrong. Or again, not wrong, but ultimately sending you down a wrong path. I love that you brought this up because you do still get a ton oh, endless. of yeah, questions and requests and messages on social media and I'm sure beyond saying like, hey, can you please train me and I want to be the next whatever and I want to be the best whatever and like, can you help me with this? And I really appreciate that you're saying this because I think, first of all, it's reflecting your own evolution and how you've learned as you've kind of moved on in your life and career and all of these things. But 
also, I think that it's a message that more people need to hear because we've talked about this before in the past. If you're going to be the best in the world at a particular sport, as you said, chances are you do not have the best health markers. You're not the healthiest person in the world because when you're pursuing literally like the fastest runner in the world, like the biggest bodybuilder in the world, whatever, you're doing something that's extreme. It's not healthy. It is what it is. But hold on. Let's asterisk this because I don't necessarily agree with that statement. Like I think there should be an acute period of time as a bodybuilder where you're accepting the fact that, hey, I'm going to be massively stressed. I'm going to be training too much and not recovering. But that's the extent of it. Like health shouldn't necessarily be a, a separate thought. Anyways, sorry. I didn't you're right. I mean, I hear what you're saying, but I think that like, because you know more of these trainers and coaches and managers and stuff than I do in professional sports that like, if you go do the blood tests of an NBA team or an NHL team or an NFL team or a sprinting or an Olympic, whatever, they're not across the board, the healthiest people in the world. They may look the best, they may be performing but, the best, but they're making sacrifices in order to... to yeah, but it, I, I believe that's a factor of not getting getting the best people to help you and not being diligent with yeah. your health yeah. ultimately, right? Like how often should we be doing blood work? How often should we be doing stool tests? How often should we be doing urine analysis? Like mm-hmm. if you're a professional athlete, monthly, at very least, monthly, once a month, every four weeks. And that way you can have objective measures of, hey, I did this. I saw this happen, right? Yeah. If I want to do a keto diet right now, if I want to do a carnivore diet and I'm a professional athlete, like Great, do it. But you got to measure it. You got to be objective about it. You have to say, hey, when I did this 30 days of carnivore, this happened. When I did this 30 days of vegan, that happened. That's very important because otherwise, how the hell do I know? And, you know, unfortunately, 30 days may not be enough to see a big shift from any type of training or any type of diet plan. I think it's six months before you really see the manifestation of what actually will express. But again, maybe that for an athlete, that's too long. Mm. So there's certainly some considerations there. But I also think it's useful to talk about, like, again, I know you were at the top of the sport and you work with and interact with other sort of elite athletes or potentially future elite athletes. But I also think it's worth mentioning, and I can speak to this as like the quote unquote, every man or every woman in this world, that the vast majority of us are not going to be Olympians. The vast majority of us want to set reasonable goals for ourselves and hopefully achieve them intelligently. And this is something that I have always in my own very small kind of modest community in my own way, I've always pushed exactly what you're saying when I was bodybuilding and competing in it, that you really have to be doing this with, first of all, a clear head, like why you're doing it in the first place, but from a health perspective and from a fun perspective too. Because again, if you're trying to make a living doing this, if you're trying to be the best in the world and it's your job, yeah, maybe it's not always fun and maybe you don't prioritize fun over work. But like for most of us, we're doing this to prove something to ourselves or to accomplish a goal or to have a good time to see what our body's capable of, whatever. And so many people lose sight of what they're trying to do. And they get this, like you said, this all or nothing or this by whatever means necessary kind of approach. And they lose all perspective. And you're thinking, okay, so now I'm like four months into this. I look like shit. I've taken a bunch of weird drugs. I feel awful. I am stressed out. I'm insecure about what I'm doing. I'm not sure if I trust this coach that's like telling me to do all of these different things. I get up on stage and I look like shit. So then I just spent thousands of dollars to feel like crap, to mess myself up metabolically, to not even place that well in the show. And I've seen it so many times with people that are friends of mine, people that I've trained with. And I'm just like, you're just losing all perspective. So I think that, again, it goes back to maybe have some really deep thoughts with yourself about why you're doing any particular competition in the first place and really figure out if this is the healthy and smart thing for you to do. And then if it is, yeah, you find some somebody who has like a similar kind of health first, intelligently planned approach that's going to do something for you that is going to be beneficial and isn't going to totally fuck up your health. Just you can have abs for two weeks. It's ridiculous. So, but what you're saying is if you need something that's going to make you excited to do it again, trying to get people to get to a high level of success in bodybuilding and still maintain their health, that's actually a pretty good challenge. Like that is actually something that you don't see a lot. I think it's absolutely doable. Like I'm actually working with a few high level athletes now and I think their health markers are getting better, right? The beauty of preparation for anything, whether it be a contest, a photo shoot, or just life, is if you have a adherence, 100% adherence to something, we can objectively measure everything. And that's beautiful. Like the issue that most people have with regard to health is there's no adherence, right? The adherence to any plan, it's usually subjective. It's like, oh, what are you doing this week? Eh, I don't know. I'm just going to eat this and do this. And it's like you said before, it's following your intuitive eating stuff. And I just don't think that makes any sense. Uh, if you're trying to be optimal, it has to be objective. Like I have a target and I'm going after that target. And then as I go, I'm going to do my best to optimize all of these 
health markers along the way. And that's liver function, and that's kidney function, that's heart function, that's insulin levels and glucose levels and inflammation and whatever else. You know, the list is obviously long, but I think those things should be synonymous. And that would be the greatest thing that an athlete or a bodybuilder should offer is 100% objective adherence. And if we can get that into someone, I think health should only get better. Right. Like, especially if I know what I'm looking at, because most professionals, especially, you know, 10 and 20 years ago, which is what we were basing this conversation on, knew nothing about health, nothing about health markers, nothing about blood and urine and stool and genetics and epigenetics. And now we do. And now we can objectify everything. And, you know, most people who are coaches in this world are setting their expertise off of an experience that may have existed in their life 10, 20, 30 years ago. Whereas now it's like, hey, no, 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 no. Like there's professionals out here who actually understand interactions in the body and biochemistry and cellular optimization and inflammation and all these things exist. And we can look at these markers objectively and say, hey, this is what's happening in your body. Let's try this as an intervention to fix it. And if that doesn't work, I know exactly the next one that will work because it's not always definitive. It's not always black and white, but we can certainly know what we're looking at, know how to fix it for the most part with a high degree of certainty and make a big shift. So again, I would go against this conversation of athletics not necessarily being healthy. Maybe at the highest level for acute periods of time, we accept high amounts of stress. We accept high amounts of challenge and low amounts of recovery. No problem. But you know what? we have a target and we say, hey, you know what, Ash, for for the next four weeks, you're going to be pretty tired. You're going to be pretty depleted. But here's what we're going to do that's going to support that. So while we know you're going to be a caloric deficit training twice a day doing aerobic work as well, while we're doing that and we know you're not going to get enough calories to replenish those systems, we're going to give you some extra sleep. We're going to give you some extra parasympathetic activities, some other things that we know are going to help modulate the autonomic nervous system, give you a little more parasympathetic stimulus to allow you to then recover at a higher level in these other systems, in these other ways that are not necessarily calories, right? So calories, as we know, is just one way of replenishing depleted energy systems or you know, ultimately creating a parasympathetic input, right? Something that helps you recover from the sympathetic stress. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to get that one this week, Ash, but instead we're going to give you this, 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 and this. You're going to have more time recovering. You're going to have more time outside. You're going to have more time sleeping. And that hopefully for this acute period will compensate really, really well for the lack of calories. And you know, if people aren't paying attention to heart rate variability and things like CO2 and breath control and breath practice when you're doing a contest or any type of preparation for an athletic event, you're missing probably in my eyes the single biggest lever, which is paying attention to heart rate variability, the autonomic nervous system, and how breath impacts that, meditation impacts that, sleep impacts that. But that's the greatest objective measure that very few people are paying attention to. This is really interesting. So does this mean that you're going to still be sort of open to taking clients, but there's going to be like a really significant vetting system? Because listen, I'll tell you, over the last like year or two, I have toyed with competing again, just because I had so many positive experiences with it. And I did manage to, because I had an intelligent coach and I, I did manage to do it the way I think that you're describing, like really intelligently with very little negative impact on my health. I won my competitions and I loved it. And I think I have a natural aptitude towards it. I was thinking, I'm like, hey, I wonder if Ben, but you know what? I'll be honest, there's no way in hell I'm sending you progress pics. So <laughs> it's not happening. <laughs> I've got just enough vanity. I'm like, Ben, I love you. I you know, appreciate your intelligence, but there's no way in hell I'm sending you like first thing in the morning, like butt shots. Like, <laughs> here's like I can't, I can't do it. You know, it's funny because I get a lot of those, right? I get a lot of those and it's often like, you see these obscure things and you're like, man, I didn't need to see that today. But I honestly look at it like furniture now, man. Like I look yeah, at it like, all right. you, know, you got girls sending me G-string pictures and I'm just like, yeah, whatever. So it's many. just, just yeah. an update. Eh. It's a different context, right? It's like, yeah, it's, it's not like you're looking. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, but anyway, anyway, so just to close this loop though, there is still a possibility and you said you are kind of like here and there. No, 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 no. So let's not go down that path. Like, yes, at some point, maybe, but right now it's not the right time. I have no financial benefit from doing this stuff. Like it's a huge time commitment to do it correctly. And I think I explain this to people at my camps is like for me to create a workout, like a six week workout takes me eight hours when you know as much as I maybe no, as many factors as I take into consideration when building a workout, it takes so much time. Man, I just don't want to take on 
something that I can't really succeed in or that I can't really commit massive amounts of time to. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my objective now, Ash, as you know, is finishing this course that I'm building for the personal training certification and finishing my book and building my online business so I can impact more people. For me to do coaching one-to-one right now makes zero sense mm-hmm. as far as time. I would have to charge so much money to make it worth my time. And that's not an egocentric thing. It's just like, there's other things I do that make me money and are a good return on my time. And for me to do monthly coaching just makes very little sense. So yes, I said I took on a few people. Usually it's someone who I know will have 100% adherence and very little time management on my part. So it's basically like we communicate once a week on WhatsApp. That's it. You know, I'll send you your workouts, send you your diet. And again, I want to make sure people are having 100% adherence because that's the only way that I can shift their life and their body. But mm-hmm. yeah, this is not a call to action of like, hey, everybody come and work with Ben now. <laughs> like, no, no, no. Yeah, yeah, at yeah. some point, like I said, at some point, the reason I'm building the certification is so that people can have these answers, right? So when we talk about things like this, how does someone learn to think this way? What variables should they be considering? That's what the certification is aiming to be. And that's why it's yeah. taking so much time. So anyone who's out there who's wanting to be a coach, who's wanting to be a trainer, this certification is going to be what you want to adhere to. And then once I've done this one, then I'm going to teach everybody what I know about building a personal training business or an online business. That's round two. That's phase two. So phase one is building out this, probably what ends up being a university level or PhD level <laughs> certification, maybe. I'm trying to tone it back, but you know, my natural inclination, as we said before we started, is doing too much and then going there and being overprepared rather than being underprepared. Yeah. I was like, come on, Ben, you need to talk to the lowest common denominator here. You need to, no, you you need to dumb it down for the rest of us. But I will say, and I'm sure you know this, that true understanding of any topic is when you can explain it to, let's just be real, the dumbest people in the room, right? Mm-hmm. Like if you can't explain a concept in simple terms, that's an indication that maybe you don't understand it well enough to tell it to other people, right? So obviously there's detail and there's complexity sure. that is going to exist, but right. you need to be able to dumb it down for the rest of us. Yeah, that's exactly it. I think being able to choose what the lowest common denominator is requires you knowing every variable that goes into the system. And that's effectively what I'm trying to build into this course is like, I'm not going to give you every detail of Krebs cycle and inflammation pathways and methylation pathways, like take a biochemistry class or read a textbook. But I think the best metaphor, and I've probably used it before on the show, but if I haven't there's a story about the boilermaker. Gentleman owns a very successful business, dependent on his engine. His engine goes down, the engine crashes. He calls every engineer in the city. Engineers can't fix the engine. He can't turn the engine back on, can't run the business. So he calls one last guy. He's the boilermaker. He calls the boilermaker in. The boilermaker walks in and goes, yeah, I've seen this before. I can help you with this. And the boilermaker looks around, listens to the sound the engine's making. You know, won't start up. He takes out his hammer. He walks over. He taps it once on the side. Engine starts up, starts working again. Everything's perfect. Business owner goes, wow, you know, how did you do that? It's incredible. He goes, well, you know, like I said, I've been doing this a long time. And the business owner says, please send me a bill. I'll take care of it tomorrow. Um, So the gentleman sends the bill. Tapping the engine with the hammer, $1. Knowing where to tap, $999. And that's effectively what we're teaching, right? Is we're teaching knowing where to tap. Rather than having all the tools in the tool belt, that's great, but knowing where to look and what to do once you see these things pop up. And that's really the greatest way to explain it is, is that's what maybe I've become good at over the last few years. And I certainly wouldn't say I'm the best in the world, but I'm sure there's people who are as good or better. But my objective is understanding every piece that goes into this puzzle. So this certification course that you're working on right now, is this going to be something that is like a limited number that people are kind of taking together and it's happening over a matter of weeks? Or is it going to be something that people can take anytime and the content is there for them? And like, do you have that part sort of sorted out yet? Yeah. So the catalyst for this was there was a few gyms, like a number of them over the last 18 months, I've reached out and said, hey, would you teach our coaches? I was like, yes, but I don't just want to teach muscle. I don't just want to teach like, hey, here's how to do this in the gym because there's people out there who are better than me at that. And so I'm like, what is my unique offering? What is my unique value? Well, my unique value is I've worked with thousands of people and I kind of can figure out this transformation process and start to decode it for people. And I don't think there's anybody out there teaching this, like how to look at a transformation. So point being like, okay, let's build this certification. And the offering to begin is three days at gyms around the world. So I've been traveling for the last five years doing these camps, which has been only about muscle, only about how to understand how to get a result in the gym. Now it's going to be everything else that goes into transformation. So point being, as I said, I'm building this course, I'm building it top to bottom, like everything that goes into it. It's taken me silly amounts of time. What I'll do is I'll teach it for three days in gyms, see how it goes, see what level of people show up. And then eventually what I'll do is I'll record those to put them into an online portal. 
and that will end up being multiple modules within an online portal. So people can take this anywhere around the world. If they can't get to me to see it, to learn it, they'll get the modules online, which will have tests, which will have books, which will have you know workbooks and study guides, all that stuff. And that's probably 12 months or 18 months away just because I want to be kind of objective and realistic about how I approach this. But there's a lot of information and that's kind of how it's evolving. That's a lot. Ben, I just realized before we go that there's something you forgot in your immune protocol stack. Bubs Naturals Collagen. Collagen is important. I there? No, actually, yeah. glycine is actually, no, <laughs> kidding aside, glycine is maybe certainly the most important amino acid when it comes to supporting your body's endogenous antioxidant system, the glutathione system. So if there's not enough glycine, your body won't produce glutathione. And anyone who has a high animal meat diet, you probably don't get enough glycine as far as the ratios to the other aminos. So Collagen is certainly an amazing source of glycine. So adding in 15 grams of collagen into my coffee every morning and then into my pre-workout shake, which is often coffee again, (laughs) depending how many times I drink coffee in a day, 15 grams of collagen before I train is a great way to ensure your body's getting enough glycine. You're getting enough other essential aminos for things like hair, skin, and nail growth. Glycine, as I said, is important in glutathione pathway, also very important in blood sugar regulation. So looking at those necessities, we want to make sure we're getting enough collagen and MCT. As you guys know, Bubs actually had an amazing Bubs MCT coffee this morning and my intelligence coffee. So good. It's just like every time I have it, it's never disappointing. It's so creamy and delicious. Okay. Can I just tell you though, to interrupt this? First of all, I said a smart thing. So I just want to recognize that. I totally said a smart thing. I was trying to be funny, but I said a smart thing. Second, I am the first to admit, we've talked about this, that I did not use their MCT. Like I told you, I'm like, eh, what do I need it for? I'm not keto. And you're like, don't be stupid. And it's delicious. And it's awesome. You should try it. And I just never did. I was like, I'm a collagen person. I don't need extra fat. I eat a ton of fat, whatever. And then I said, you know what? Screw it. Because they're sending me all this great product. I'm going to try it. I started putting MCT in my, of course, iced coffee because I drink iced coffee like a weirdo all year long. And it is actually delicious. I didn't realize that it actually just made your coffee taste so much better. Like it really (laughs) is very good. So I'm a little late on that train, but I just want to admit like to Bubs and you and everybody, I'm like, I totally picked this up late and now I use it like every morning in my coffee. Ash, I know I I get excited about things on the podcast, (laughs) but there's a lot of things in life that I don't get excited about, like namely everything, right? If if something... (laughs) Really, if if something isn't actually really exciting, yeah. I'm not going to be like, hey, Ash, you should do this. Like, yeah. it's not me. So now you know. I'm learning that. I'm I mean, learning, okay? Yeah. So Most it's things I think are absolute BS and just like, don't waste your time with that, Ash. Go after this one. But when I say something's good, now you know. As with every single person who tried fresh pressed olive oil, I've mm-hmm. got 300 messages of people going, dude, this is actually really good. I'm like, I know it's really good. I told you that. (laughs) And they're coming back too, by the way. So that's something we can tease for people because I know that they're very like cyclical and inventory based and stuff and their stuff has been super high demand, but we're going to be offering some stuff from them coming up soon, right? So you're going to laugh. I just moved, right? In my pantry, I have a very small number of things because these are the things I actually use. I have a massive amount of fresh best olive oil. I have a good amount of real sea salt and I have a good amount of bubs. That's kind of it. I have one more spice that I use often. It's called borosari. It's amazing. But usually I'm using the Redmond's Real Salt and I'm using olive oil. And also I'll add, actually, I do have apple cider vinegar, which kind of goes on everything too. That's kind of the extent of my simple living. And I have a ton of amazing high quality meat. A lot of it comes from Belcampo because Anya's amazing and hooked me up. A lot of it comes from another company I use, Blackwing, no affiliation, just amazing companies. And that's kind of it. So I keep my life. Okay. Okay. So wait, here's the ad read. Here's the podcast read for today. Ben is excited about three things. And one of them is MCT. Bubs. Yeah. How does, does that work? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you're, right. you're like, I'm excited about very few things. And MCT and collagen are two of the three things. And again, it's something that should be in everyone's diet every day, I think. Well, MCT is maybe not in everyone's diet every day, but I think it's a great way to get in some fats that are not going to be stored as fat. They're going to be immediately used to fuel your energy, fuel your mind. So MCT is directly converted into ketones to go into your brain for energy. So we want that. That's great. And that tastes so damn good in your coffee, especially when you add some collagen and some lion's mane peeps. Actually, here's a cool thing that's happening. I have now sourced liquid alpha GPC. So everyone knows in my intelligent coffee, I'm having MCT, 
collagen, lion's mane, and alpha GPC. Alpha GPC as a powder is fantastic, but as a liquid, it's even better to go in coffee because I can carry it around. It almost acts like stevia because it adds this little bit of sweetness. I'll send you some ash. It's really, really good. I sourced it and it's going to be part of the Muscle Intelligence Supplement line because I love it and I want to make it part of my life. That's coming out soon. That's a little foreshadowing for everybody. We have a very small number of products coming to a website near you pretty soon. All right. That's very exciting. Look, can I just say for the record before we sign off here that the one thing your listeners have to give us because all podcasts have sponsors, but like you got to give us at least that we do not have rehearsed ad reads because this stuff just comes out of nowhere. Like I'm trying to be clever. I'm trying to bring it up. And then we go off on like a tangent about what we put in our coffee and it's like a whole thing. So at least this isn't like rehearsed, you know, script that someone's given us. Like this is the real. real, Yeah. I think that's why people like it and actually buy our stuff or buy the products that the sponsors are offering is because mm-hmm. it's actually shit we'd use <laughs> and it's stuff we actually yeah. like, right? It's not just like, yeah. hey, let's buy Frank's underwear because Frank pays us a thousand dollars. Like, yeah, uh, no, thanks. Um, yep. Let's actually promote things we believe in and things that people will benefit from. And it doesn't have yeah. to be uh, salesy. It just has to be organic and like, hey, guys, go read this book. Hey, guys, go do this. Anyways, that being said, we need our habit of the week, Ash. We've been slacking on that lately. Let me pull up the 44. Okay, while you pull that up, let's just also say for people who now have heard us talking about collagen and MCT that the discount they're giving you, which is better than most companies, is 20% if you use the code intelligence. And 10% of all of their sales go to charity, which is basically unheard of with any company, which is just another reason why I love those guys. So we'll put that in the show notes too. But if you want to buy any of the collagen or MCT that we use every day. You can use the code intelligence at bubsnaturals.com and crush that. All right. So my habit of the week is going to be multifold and I'm going to kind of blend a couple of these together. So I'm noticing, and this is myself as well, it becomes really, really easy. Even with someone who maybe classifies himself as relatively self-disciplined to give up your time, to unconsciously allow your time to dissolve and with the levels of manipulation of cell phones these days, it seems extremely challenging to not be manipulated by social media. So let's implement a challenge to everybody listening that you do not touch your phone for the first three hours that you're awake, except if it's an alarm. If you have children, that may be an exception, but I would love for everybody, because most people listening to this could very easily not touch their phone for the first three hours of the day. So no checking email, no checking social media, no checking text, no texting. I mean, calling, great, but you know, other than that, the habit that we're talking about is be ruthless with your time and ultimately create a morning that serves you, that allows you to create person you want to become and the person that you are striving for because it's very easy for life to pass us by and you know days go by weeks go by 12 months go by nothing changes so it's so important to live an objective life we talked about this last time ash an objective life rather than a subjective life i give you all the objective of no phones for the first three hours of the day and i want you to do that for the entire month of march and let's see what happens to your life let's see how much time opens up in your day in your life and Maybe it's longer than that. Maybe it's, hey, we only pick up the phone an hour a day at noon and then at six or something, two hours a day, right? Let's see if we can do that and how much time opens up because we all make this excuse around time and guilty as charged. But I'm doing the same. I'm going to say, hey, for the first three hours of the day, no phone. And certainly for the last three hours of the day, no phone. And I'm going to do my best to kind of curb it in the middle as well. So anyone that wants to reach me, Ash, don't reach me the morning or the night. Just don't bother. First thing in the morning or last thing at night. Don't worry about it. Ever. Okay. That's a challenging one. But I think, like you said, it's one of those things that we think about how did we live before smartphones when we were on them all the fucking time being distracted? We did just fine, right? So just being a little bit more intentional about when you're on your phone, using it for what you need to and realizing you don't really need it the rest of the time. It's attached to you for no reason. It's just kind of tethering you to distractions. So yeah, that's going to be an intense one for people, but I think it's a worthwhile challenge. Yeah, we can do it. And if you're doing it, let me know and I'll support you guys on social. Hit me up, hit Ashley up at the Muscle Maven and me at BPAC Fitness. We'd love to hear from you guys. Thank you. Let's end it there. There's one thing I want to talk about on the next podcast, Ash, the next Q&A that's super important, but we will leave Next week is another week. Another time. Thank you for tuning yep. in to the Muscle Intelligence Podcast. Super grateful for your time. I hope we're providing value. If we are, we'd love to have a review. We'd love to have you share it with at least one person you know and love. If you want to leave a review, head over to iTunes or just hit up Ashley on Instagram and tell her she's awesome and she needs to send more pictures of 
Chicken livers. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in to Muscle Intelligence. If you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to share it with at least one person you know. Make sure you're subscribed so you never miss an episode. This podcast is for information purposes only. The statements and views on this podcast are not medical advice. This podcast, including Ben Bikulski and the producers, disclaim responsibility for any possible adverse effects from the use of information contained herein. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. This podcast may contain paid endorsements or advertisements for products or services. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest and products or services referred to herein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician.